Fire! Welcome! So this is going to be the first of what I hope is a fairly regular series for me where I review some documentaries that I've watched. Some old, but in this case, the one I'm going to talk about today, some new. And I'm just going to get straight into this. The documentary film that I wanted to review today was one that only came out, I think, originally the end of 2020. And I saw it on TV. It had its premiere on BBC Two um, the previous Monday. And that was the football sports documentary, Finding Jack Charlton. What's football about? You're at Wembley Stadium. And a ball is crossed from the right wing, and you go, boom, boom. That's his medal. People say to me, was that the most memorable day of your life? Joys and management are totally different to Joys as a player. It's not the same, Jack. It's dementia. I couldn't remember a lot of the memories. And it's a shame because he's had some good memories. Jack, perfect goal! My dad made notes. I'm a batterer, a fowler. <laughs> what are you clapping for? On players, family and tactics. We kept them all. Ireland was engulfed in war and conflict. Nobody would have given you odds that we'd have an Englishman manage the team. Our way of playing is completely new. If you didn't like it, tough luck. My brother Jack was an uncompromising character. Jack said, if you don't get off the bus today, you'll never play for this country again. This is a time when it gives you the opportunity now, not only to go. Come on. What did it mean to leave Ireland to the World Cup finals? You talking about financially? <laughs> hey, it was an extraordinary adventure. My bag of nerves here. They think a lot of you, don't they, in Ireland? No idea. Bobby did what Bobby wants to do. I love them. Now hit me, come on! Rub it! Never assume they know and understand. He's done more in his lifetime than people would do in ten lifetimes. Be a dictator, but be a nice one. And I just want to say right away, what an absolutely outstanding piece of filmmaking this was. I do like documentaries. Nine times out of ten, I will choose to watch something factual over like an hour and a half, two hour plus fictional movie. And this documentary about the former footballer, manager, Jack Charlton, just goes to show what an emotive and powerful genre documentary filmmaking is. Where do I begin? This was a look kind of at the whole life of a legendary figure in English and later Irish football. We do get to see his part that he played in England's 1966 World Cup victory over West Germany and even little snatches of him during his time as a player at Leeds and when he started his managerial career in, I think, the late 70s at Middlesbrough. But really, this documentary is about two things. It's about Jack Charlton's career as the Republic of Ireland manager, a job that he took in, I think it was 1986, and do excuse me that I've not made any notes or anything for this, but um, I'm going to try and remember as much as I can. And also, because this movie, this documentary was made, I think it was produced mostly around the last year to 18 months of Jack Charlton's life. He passed away in, I think it was July 2020. It was also a look at what dementia does to a person, a man, a public figure, and someone who was so verbose and outspoken in his lifetime like Jack Charlton was. The real backdrop for finding Jack Charlton is 
where he takes the Republic of Ireland manager's job in 1986. And this was at a point where Ireland, the Irish national football team, had never qualified for a major international tournament throughout history. They'd never qualified for a World Cup or a European Championship. This was quite a controversial appointment, simply because Jack Charlton was an Englishman, <laughs> an Englishman who had won the World Cup. He was taking a job in mid-1980s Ireland, a country which then was still very anti-English and very conservative and religious. It was a glorified religious state, you could say, and probably till well into the 90s, arguably beyond. And it showed the prejudices that Jack had to face during this early stage of him taking this job, but how he, with his wit and his no-nonsense style approach to not only football management and dealing with his players, but also to the media and to fans of football and his peers, just how he was a blunt speaker, but he did it with humour and warmth, um, how he won over the Irish population, he won over a whole country who, and if you think about Ireland sort of 35, 40 years ago, in the north there was civil war essentially with the Troubles, those in the Republic, there was a lot of anti-English sentiment. I'm speaking of someone who has lived in Ireland during a period of my life and uh, I moved there in 2012 and I said to my partner at the time, who was an Irish woman, I said, am I going to get any prejudice by moving as soon as they hear my accent because of all the bad blood that's gone between England and Ireland? I'd visited the country three or four times before I moved there, just for like short breaks and to see my partner. I just wanted to move there as soon as possible. Beautiful country. But when I dis made the decision that I was going to live there permanently, I was worried that I'm going to run into difficulties because I'm going to be in a minority. Not because of the way I look, obviously, but by the way that I sound and the fact that I'm English, I'm British. I'd always had an affinity with Ireland, and really, I think Jack Charlton, for me, was uh, a big part of that. Because, for those who don't know, um, the Republic of Ireland is my national team. They're the team who I support whenever they're in a major tournament, which sadly hasn't been that many in recent years even above England, even though England are obviously my national team birth-wise, but Ireland will always be the team that I look out for, and obviously I want England to do well as well. But if Ireland were playing England, I would be on the side of the boys in green. But that's just uh, something about me. And I think a lot of that stemmed from kind of the mid-90s, sort of 94, when England failed to qualify for that World Cup. But Ireland qualified, and once again, and I'll talk a little bit about the previous... Jack Charlton led tournaments in a moment. Ireland were, even though geographically it is, but politically Ireland isn't part of the British Isles, but geographically it's there as a island next to Britain. And um, they were just kind of like our, as in British people's reps, in this tournament because England, Scotland, and Wales and Northern Ireland never qualified for anything back then anyway. But they were there at USA 94, and that was Jack Charlton again. This part of the documentary, which talked about the political problems that uh, were rife in Ireland at the time, and it also made mention of other things that had nothing to do with Jack Charlton or football particularly, but things like since the early 80s about how many hundreds of thousands of people had emigrated from Ireland, mainly to the United States and just how it was a country that people were desperate to leave. Which for me seems quite ironic really, given that I loved living there. It'll always be kind of a second home to me. It's just a beautiful country with really kind and warm-hearted people. But at this point, when Jackie Charlton first went to Ireland to take that managerial job, it was a very different country, and you saw scenes of bombing and violence on the street, and. Um, anti-English sentiment. Later on, you saw a lot of English football hooligans sort of being quite derogatory about the Irish. You know, all the sort of horrible bigotry that 
I like to think that we've kind of moved past as a civilization. mainly. I know we haven't fully. There's always going to be idiots out there who just judge someone from where they come from or by the colour of the skin or the accent of their voice. But generally, I like to think that we've all kind of grown over our lifetimes. But as I say, Jack, he won rounds the Irish population just by playing maybe not the most attractive football, but just by getting Ireland results and getting them to their first major championship tournament in 1988, which would have been the European Championship in Germany. And as if by kind of design from the gods, Ireland's opening match at Euro 88 was against England, and they won 1-0. And he always said throughout this film, I was a proud Englishman, but this was a job that was offered to me, and I knew that I could do it well and to the best of my abilities. So... I always want England to win, except for when they play in Ireland. And Ireland won that match 1-0. And I remember England had a pretty crappy tournament that year. Without wanting to go on about the football too much, but we then fast-forwarded to Italian 90. And I do have a lot of abiding memories of Italian 90. The 1990 World Cup. Ireland qualified for that. That was their first ever World Cup. Um, there again, another tournament where Ireland exceeded their expectations, really. And Jack Charlton and the players just had a great time. You saw footage on the player and staff coach. And they even visited the Pope. And you saw all these Irish fans. Some of them had, like, remortgaged the homes and quit the jobs. Just so that you could say, I saw my country at a World Cup. Because it had never happened before. This was something brand new for this nation, our neighbour, like 150, 200 miles to the west of us. 1994, USA, um, the next World Cup four years later, Ireland had qualified for that. That was Jack Charlton's uh, final World Cup appearance, managing Ireland. Um, I think he would have resigned or been asked to resign from the job um, about a year and a half, two years later, something like that. He didn't work another managerial role, but by that point, I mean, he would have been manager of Ireland probably the best part of a decade by when he left in, I think, sometime in 96, I believe. He'd been made an Irish citizen by the president at that point in the 90s. A big honour. I don't think there'd been a non-Irishman without any obvious Irish lineage who'd been made an honorary citizen there in like hundreds of years or something like that this is fascinating to me i do like sports documentaries I, I like football documentaries particularly and wrestling ones because they're the two sports that i'm mainly interested in but i will watch pretty much any documentary about a lot of different sports even ones i'm not that interested in for example there's um, a really good series on netflix about the chicago bulls and michael jordan in the 1990s uh, I can't remember what it's called. I'll flash it up on screen. That's um, a really good documentary series on Netflix if you've not seen it. And even if you've got no interest in basketball, it's very, very interesting. Going back to finding Jack Charlton, for me, what was the emotional crux of this documentary was that as we kept going back to the present day or the final 18 months of Charlton's life, and we saw a man, a quiet old man, suffering with dementia and he was being played sort of these moments on a laptop and his wife was there sort of oh do you remember this jack no i don't remember it even though he's there watching him as a younger guy clips of him and his brother bobby at the world cup in 66 and that was the heartbreaking thing and it just drove home to me and i'm sure it drove home to everyone who's watched this that dementia is just such a cruel bastard of a disorder oh it just robs you of the one thing that you think that you're gonna have forever your memories and it's just so sad it was uplifting when you saw that jack there was kind of like some recognition like sometimes he would say like oh i've remembered when sometimes you could see oh he remembered something like oh yeah and he'd make a comment and he had his wife and his son and his grandchildren around him. And, you know, if you didn't know who he was, this kind of blusterful, outspoken, sometimes controversial, but always entertaining, larger-than-life manager, he just looked like some sort of quiet granddad, you know, just kind of spending time quietly with his grandchildren. And we saw flashback scenes where he was sort of laughing and joking and being funny at after-dinner speeches, probably in the kind of late 90s onwards. 
after he'd retired from management. The documentary also touched upon his kind of not massively close relationship with Bobby Charlton, his younger brother, and how Bobby was seen as kind of like the creative player of the two and the more talented one, whereas Jack was kind of like this sort of hard case workhorse type player they kind of not had a massive falling out but they just sort of fell out of contact with one another for a lot of their lives later on and that was something that was never resolved really which is really sad and apparently and i didn't even realize but bobby charlton who is still with us but he suffers with dementia now too and there was um, some talk of linking dementia in football players of a certain age with constantly heading the ball back in uh, their professional playing days. This is raising awareness for a really serious illness and a really heartbreaking disorder. That was so heartwarming for me to be able to see this guy who is so loved by his family and is so loved by a whole country that he was made an Irish citizen just for managing a football team. Ireland of the 1980s and 90s was a bit of a joke football wise even when they started to do well because everyone was saying oh it's just a bunch of plastic paddies or people getting in on the family rule and then the family rule back then and well it still applies today just that you don't hear of it as much was um, like an Englishman or a Scotsman who couldn't get in his own national team. If his parent or his grandparents had Irish citizenship, he would qualify for Ireland. And that meant people like, you know, Andy Townsend, uh, Tony Cascarino, I think was another one. A lot of people ended up playing for Ireland when they were never born in Ireland, but their parent or grandparent was. But you've heard from all the legendary Irish footballers of that era, that 80s and 90s era, such as David O'Leary, who was dropped from the Irish squad for two years in the late 80s because he refused to cancel a family holiday to play in some friendly tournament. So Jack Charlton, you know, stubborn guy, just dropped him for two years, one of the best defenders in the English Football League and certainly Ireland's best defender. Um, and he wouldn't pick him until, I think, 1990. And also you heard from Paul McGrath, who had a really interesting story himself within this film about his mentor, his boss, Jack. Um, Paul McGrath, a mixed-race child, he was brought up in an orphanage and Paul McGrath grew up with a lot of bigotry. You know, Ireland was quite a bigoted nation and against people of colour back when he was growing up in the 1960s, 1970s, but his skill as a footballer there again, he was considered one of the best defenders of his era. And he talked about his alcoholism and how Jack Charlton tried to help him. Sometimes he couldn't even pick himself up off the ground until someone had given him a drink of vodka or something. He had the DTs one day and Jack Charlton in a kind of rare moment of compassion said look you know i'll help you and that was a really interesting insight i think i've talked enough about this film i just want to say go and watch it even if you've got no interest in football it's kind of like a really interesting potted history of modern or yesterday island kind of 1980s onwards and also just a really touching and in-depth tribute to a man who I've got a lot of memories of Jack Charlton the manager obviously I wasn't born when he was a player back in the 1960s when Ireland were qualifying for tournaments World Cups etc he was often on TV being interviewed and such and such and I always found there was like two really kind of entertaining characters in English or British or British slash Irish football management of the kind of 1980s for me growing up as a child and watching final score in grandstand match of the day etc and there were nottingham forest manager brian clough and ireland's jack charlton and those two fellas were never at a loss for words they always had something to say and they wouldn't sugarcoat anything but they were just so damn entertaining with it and both of these really sort of characters of their age these charismatic figures have both gone now and it's kind of makes me reflect on mortality really but just to see jack charlton kind of almost waste away as you see him sat in his home really quiet 
and he can't really remember anything and he's having to look at a laptop and old clips of himself in the hope that he'll jog something. I'll mention the very end of the film where he starts singing this, I think it was like a Geordie mining song or something, I can't remember what the song is called, that um, he often sang with the island team at Italian 90 and probably elsewhere. And um, he's listening to it on a record player and he sat there and he starts singing it. That's enough of a memory and he starts singing along to this record. And that's the very end of the film and it cuts to a black screen saying Jack Charlton died peacefully in July 2020. Ah, oh, that was... Ah, oh, I'm getting shivers down my spine thinking about it. That was such an emotional and touching scene. I'm going to rank this documentary and I'll score all future documentaries that I'm going to be talking about in any of these future videos, assuming that you like this concept enough for me to do more because being such a doc fan, I've got a lot to talk about and I'll no doubt watch many more and want to talk about those as well. But I'm going to rank this as 9 out of 10 for me. It was quite a long watch, but it didn't feel sort of a chore. It was fascinating and touching and heartbreaking at times. And it just touched on a lot of the points that I am personally am fascinated in, like the social and political history of Ireland and football in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And of course it made me learn about dementia and it raised awareness for me about that and I'm sure it will have done for many other people as well. So as a documentary it just works on so many levels but it's still available on iPlayer as I'm recording this today and as this will be going up. So you can watch it for free, I think it's also available to buy digitally and on Blu-ray, DVD etc. But it is available free on iPlayer I think for the foreseeable future. So if you have not seen Finding Jack Charlton and you've even got the remotest, most passing interest in anything relating to football or sport or just kind of British and Irish recent history, this is a documentary that you have to see and that's why I'm giving it 9 out of 10. So thank you very much. I think there's probably lots of things about Finding Jack Charlton that I've not talked about but I've been talking long enough and um, I suggest you just go and watch it. But I want to thank you all for watching this review and special thanks as always to my wonderful subscribers and patrons. I'm going to go now and please will you join me again and like I say leave all your comments down in the comment section and let me know if you'd like me to do more of these documentary reviews. But I will hopefully see you again for another documentary review. Cheers everyone. See ya.